Welcome to the third day of Criminal Law uh, Lecture Series accompanying my casebook. Uh, today we're going to be talking about criminalization uh, and we you know we'll go through some of the basics of uh, our society's decisions to make certain crimes criminal and to leave other acts uh, decriminalized or wholly legal. And so to start, you know, this is, as I mentioned in, in the beginning, what this course is about, the substance of criminal law, what we criminalize, how we criminalize it, how we define those crimes. And so I think it's helpful to start with some easy examples where there's universal agreement in terms of a set of conduct and acts uh, that should be criminalized, and then to move to more and more difficult cases, and to see that even in the easy cases, there's exceptions, and there's circumstances where um, there is disagreement, or uh, the law does not fully punish or criminalize the relevant conduct. Um, so, you know, in the United States, we have uh, many different jurisdictions, all the states, the territories, the District of Columbia, and the federal system all make different decisions on what to criminalize, but there are a lot of commonalities amongst them. Uh, so uh, one obvious example is murder, right? Homicide. Um, homicide is generally the bigger category of which murder is uh, the worst of the offenses. And we'll talk more about the language of homicide uh, when we get to that chapter. Uh, everyone agrees, right? Murder should be legal. This is a, a universal norm. Um, and so this would maybe be our easiest case, right? We don't want a society where everyone is just free to kill another person with no consequences. And yet, and yet, even within this easy case, there are going to be situations where our society excuses or justifies murder, self-defense being a prominent example. Um, and so, you know, we have to define the contours of what constitutes murder, uh, when uh, should it be excused, which will come up in our affirmative uh, defenses section at the end. Um, so even the, the easiest example we have, um, we already start to see some wiggle room, some boundaries that the law, criminal law, uh, won't uh, cross. So that's pretty easy. But then we move to, say, theft, right? You know, and theft, of course, comes in many different variations. We have petty theft, which is usually low value items, grand theft, uh, or as the slide indicates, grand theft auto, if we're specifically dealing with uh, vehicles. Uh, we have embezzlement. Uh, fraud is uh, potentially considered a form of theft. Um, it's a crime against property. Um, and, you know, this is, again, something that's, that's very broad-based across societies, uh, even in, a, in a, a communist nation where we would have a state ownership of property, there's still theft laws, right? People taking what is not theirs is considered to be a, a crime uh, when it's taken from another uh, civilian. Um, but again, there will be instances where things that might, you know, appear to be theft um, aren't considerate. Like if you accidentally take the property of another, right? If you have two similar suitcases, you grab the wrong one off the turnstile at the airport, um, our rules will say, eh, maybe we shouldn't charge that person. And we'll talk about that when we get to mens rea and the distinctions there. There's also sometimes where our law is slow uh, to recognize new forms of theft, and it has to adapt and change or uh, be amended. Um, this was true uh, in the mid-20th century in many states uh, when uh, people who were in partnerships or other business associations would take money from those partnerships without the permission of their other partners, some jurisdictions said, well, that's not theft, because if you're an owner of the relevant business association, then you can't be stealing from yourself. And so laws had to be amended to recognize, yeah, but you are stealing from your other partners. And so that became criminalized over time. So again, theft, another easy case, a crime against property, uh, where there's going to be uh, some confusion and wiggle room uh, it, in specific fact settings. And then we get to assault and battery. Uh, and again, assault and battery, um, the, the language here is often a, a bit confused. I'll talk about that in a second. But assault and battery is sort of a core crime that we see across all jurisdictions. And the notion is you just don't go up and hit people in the head or whatever. Um, I don't know what this particular move is depicted in the slide. Uh, sometimes when you're looking for fair use images on Google, you discover very strange uh, things. Uh, but in this case, you know, it, it also is potentially a sport, which shows that, well, okay, maybe, again, assault and battery is something 
something that is not uh, universally criminalized. In fact, uh, a lot of our, um, not all, but a lot of our sports are just legalized assault and battery um, because uh, football, right? If a linebacker runs full speed and tackles a quarterback on the field, even if it was an illegal hit, um, that's not going to rise uh, to the level of our criminal law. Why it doesn't? Well, that gets a little more confusing, right? Why it's not clear. We might say it's because of consent. Other jurisdictions that basically have a sports exception uh, read into their law. But the idea is we actually not only legalize assault and battery in some cases, but we cheer it on. Um, and there's varying degrees of it, right? MMA uh, certainly has a lot. Mixed martial arts, right? You have very high degrees of assault and battery. But even relative non-contact sports like basketball, you have pushing, you have shoving, you have people trying to get position. Uh, those are all forms of assault and battery. Now, I mentioned at the top, the language here is a little confusing. Historically, assault was putting somebody in fear of bodily harm, but not actually doing the bodily harm. And then battery was the execution of that. But in fact, statutes use the terms all different ways, and that distinction is has long since evaporated in many states in practice. Um, I will generally use the terms this way. So I'll refer to assault as creating a fear of battery, and battery being the actual physical unwanted touching. And so uh, we'll, we'll look at a few cases in that area. So these are three easy examples. Two are crimes against person, murder, assault, battery. One's a crime against property, theft. And those is sort of larger meta categories, crimes against person and crimes against property, are generally easy to find, um, to define. There will be some examples. Kidnapping is, you know, again, something you might think is pretty easy, but when you start getting into custodial interference fact patterns, it suddenly becomes a little trickier uh, to define, and that's considered a crime against a person. But what happens when we go beyond those two, right? What happens when we step outside of crimes against another person and crimes against property? Uh, how then do we decide what the law is? And this is where the excerpt from Henry Hart's uh, essay is helpful. Um, a lot of students uh, want to find some sort of controlling theory or rule or insight into our criminal law and say this explains the way our criminal law is and and that's a fool's errand to try and find that uh, our laws are derived from many different values many different theories but ultimately they're just the product of representative democracy and there's nothing that requires representative democracy to be consistent uh, laws can be wholly in conflict from an, an abstract theoretical level with each other other. And that's not considered to be a, uh, an, an argument uh, that you can make in a court of law. You can't just say, well, these two laws have underlying theories that just don't work together. Therefore, I want the prosecution against me dismissed. That doesn't work in criminal law. Um, in common law, and some of the other courses, you will see a, a desire among judges to harmonize the law across uh, many areas in certain instances. But in criminal law, each statute and each jurisdiction operates as an island um, that doesn't require resolution um, with a larger body of statutes or rules. Okay, so if we're done talking about the easy cases, which it turns out aren't that easy, uh, let's move to the harder cases. Um, now, uh, Lawrence v. Texas is a case that you can look at from many different directions. Uh, it's most often spoken of in terms of the constitutional rights of the 14th Amendment and whether or not Texas's anti-sodomy law uh, was a violation of uh, liberty interests and individual autonomy and dignity. Um, it also can be talked about in terms of equal protection but that was only Justice O'Connor's concurring opinion that made that argument. But in this course, I want us to focus on the, the parts that I've edited, which although they mention the constitutional aspects, it's really a debate between Justice Kennedy's majority opinion and Justice Scalia's dissenting opinion about what is the appropriate scope of criminal law and a free democratic society. And they have very different views of it. Right. Each of them has a perspective that um, would allow for a very different uh, set of laws governing um, our society. And importantly, it, we don't have to say that, you know, Scalia mandates all these laws be implemented, right? You know, because he has a much more permissive um, rule for what the state can criminalize than Kennedy does, but his rule would potentially allow that. Um, in contrast, 
Scalia paints Kennedy as requiring an enormous retraction of existing criminal laws, and that uh, the holding of the majority opinion, according to Scalia, would result in a far different uh, uh, set of statutes and criminal law than we currently have, uh, because a lot would have to be uh, amended or would be struck down. Okay, so what actually happens in Lawrence v. Texas? Well, the facts are pretty straightforward. There is actually a, a minor historical factual footnote that the underlying facts might not even be exactly what happened, but um, that's a, a Dale Carpenter, a professor who's looked at that in greater detail. It's not really here nor there, but it's an interesting side note for the case. Um, so we have people in the privacy of um, a residence who are uh, caught and then prosecuted for what Texas considers to be deviant sexual intercourse, and as the complaint says, anal sex in this case, by a member of the same sex, in this case, two men. And we look here at the statute to define deviant sexual intercourse. And so I want to make a little side note here. Uh, throughout uh, these lectures and throughout my course, it's important to focus on statutes. This course is about statutes. And even though we'll sometimes get to more... Uh, I shouldn't say I should say broader rules or constitutional rules that cross statutes. For the most part, you start with the statutes, and so the excerpts and the cases I've edited, edited, I try to always have as much of the text of the relevant statute as possible. Sometimes the courts are not so good at doing that, but in most cases, I tried to pick court opinions that had the statutory language, so you would be able to start there. Um, and so here, uh, Texas's statute says any contact between any part of the genitals of one person of the mouth or anus of another person, or the penetration of the genitals or anus of another person with an object. Um, and that's, you know, not uh, an unusual way uh, to define uh, an anti-sodomy law. Anti-sodomy laws are primarily existed uh, at this time in the South and in the Midwest, including uh, Kansas. Um, but notably, uh, it, it includes that, to many students' surprise, oral sex, um, because it is something that is uh, quite common, according to sex surveys, and yet it would be illegal, at least under Texas's law, um, for members of the same sex. Uh, under the older opinion, which is overturned in this, Bowers v. Hardwick, uh, the Georgia law actually applied uh, to everyone. So any oral sex in the state of Georgia uh, would be legal. And so this is a little surprising to students realizing that our laws is broad. Other jurisdictions define um, uh, anti-sodomy in terms of uh, what they call crimes against nature, which is a very loaded phrase. And so they group it with bestiality, which to many of our modern sensibilities sound strange, right? That it, people engaging in oral sex consensually, human beings and an animal, but this goes back, is very, those are very different things, but you know, historically, um, the roots treated them both uh, in the same sort of judgment as crimes against nature and humanity. And that's, that's a, a phrasing that you see more in some of the Southern states. Okay, so there's no doubt the law is violated. The parties stipulate to that. Um, and so the question before us is, is this a law that we should have? Now, in the United States, the, really the only mechanism for that question to be adjudicated in, in, um, is either the federal or state constitutions. Um, it's not just enough to say, this is a bad law, it shouldn't be on the books. That's not how it works. But for our purposes, we want to leave aside any any aspects of the constitutional doctrine that would complicate it, and just view Justice Kennedy and Justice Scalia's view of what the government should be allowed to do. Um, Justice Kennedy writes an opinion here, um, which you know is, is often lauded and celebrated for recognizing this broader interest for people, particularly adults, to engage in uh, private sexual activity. But I want to point out that the opinion is is quite vague uh, in terms of what the contours and rationales underlying this right. Uh, Justice Kennedy likes to use the word uh, dignity a lot, and dignity is a concept that's often hard to pin down in terms of how we apply it. Uh, similarly, Justice Kennedy's opinion, you know, itself carves out 
uh, certain things that the uh, majority opinion shouldn't apply to without explaining why. Um, one of those will be very important when we look at uh, a case in this chapter, which is he says it does not include prostitution, or in other words, paid sex work. And uh, why it doesn't? Well, that commercial, non-commercial distinction is, is only stated, not justified in the course of the majority opinion. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why, as we'll talk about, Lawrence v. Texas's precedental effect has actually been quite narrow. Um, and although it may have been an important step in later cases being decided to protect same-sex relationships, particularly in the context of marriage or in uh, domestic partner benefits, um, but beyond that, things like other private sexual practices that people would engage in, it has had almost no effect. And I think a lot of that is owed to Justice Kennedy's vague and sometimes confusing uh, uh, wording and, and uh, explanations of the scope of the Lawrence right, as I'll refer to it. Okay, so what about Justice Scalia? Well, Justice Scalia, you know, thinks that Bowers v. Hardwick should stay good law. And he goes through a litany of um, situations that uh, he thinks the, the government should be allowed to criminalize, that would no longer be allowed to criminalize under Kennedy's holding, and ultimately believes that the Texas law is an expression of um, uh, the democratic will of the people, and it should not be supplanted uh, by uh, Justice Kennedy's um, uh, theory of dignity and autonomy. A part uh, of the Kennedy opinion that I didn't edit fully in, uh, but it is important, but it, you, it's only mentioned slightly, is this concept of historical animus, uh, which is the idea that Kennedy says mere animus uh, that's existed over a long period of time should not be a sole basis for uh, a law to be, or, or for conduct to be criminalized. And so the government needs to offer more than that. And what he's really saying is, is bigotry. Um, and, you know, historical animus is kind of a, a, a way to phrase it, but from his perspective, he's saying uh, it is bigoted uh, to focus on uh, this type of conduct. That was the basis for the law, and it was a crime, as depicted in the slide here, that was often punished quite seriously at various times in history. Although the story that was in Bowery v. Hardwick that Kennedy does uh, spend time outside of the expert uh, correctly, or, or I'm sorry, correcting the, the story of Bowers v. Hardwick uh, was wrong, that it has always been harshly punished and criminalized. In fact, um, the, the modern trend it, that predated Bowers v. Hardwick showed a, a very different perspective on um, oral sex, sodomy, and same-sex relations. Um, so how do we evaluate these two opinions? Right, We want to look at them from a, uh, a legal perspective. Well, a big part of being a 1L is this phrase, thinking like a lawyer, and that can mean a lot of different things. But one of them is, whatever your views ideologically about Scalia and Kennedy's opinions, set them aside and let's think through the arguments right, and see how they work. Uh, in terms of what our society should be. So let's let's um, consider the way Scalia is painting Kennedy's opinion, because I actually find that better than trying to deduce what Kennedy's actually saying as a starting point. Um, so one view of the Kennedy opinion is that, um, and, and Scalia is, is making this argument explicitly and implicitly throughout his dissent, which is that Kennedy has embraced John Stuart Mill's harm principle. And the harm principle, you know, is basically says if a person is not harming another, then they should be allowed to engage in that conduct, which isn't harmful. Um, there are, you know, a lot of nuance and details that have been added, and those you can examine on your own, or perhaps you have in a political philosophy course as an undergrad. But for now, I think that's a, a good encapsulation. Um, the reason uh, that that Scalia thinks that Kennedy has embraced this, I think, has to do with the fact that Kennedy's language in some cases is very broad, in some cases very narrow, and there isn't a strongly articulated theory as to why sexual liberty should be uh, protected. And so one view, the broad view of the Kennedy opinion is, it's, it's an embracement, embracing of the harm principle. And this is why Scalia creates what rhetorically we would know as a parade of horribles. Um, he goes through a laundry list throughout various parts of the excerpted opinion of laws that he thinks will no longer uh, be uh, allowable under the Constitution after Kennedy's opinion, and it's you know it's clear that Scalia believes the government should 
have these laws, if not, um, you know, actually put them on the books, that this should be within their power. I do think it's fair to say that Scalia actually thinks most of these laws, if not all of them, are, are good as well. Um, but it's not necessary for his argument to make that point. Um, and it's quite a list. Um, you, if you look through it, you see some common threads, but then there's some outliers here. Um, and I just want to walk through them just to tell you how he's making this argument and how it's played out in later court opinions. So the first one, sex toys, um, is a little surprising. Well, so a couple states have actually criminalized the sale of sex toys. And of all of Scalia's predictions, if we think this parade of horribles is actually a set of predictions, this is the one he probably did the best on. Um, there is a s ongoing circuit split that may never be resolved uh, between Texas's and Alabama's sex toy uh, prohibitions. Uh, in one case, the circuit court said, um, yeah, Lawrence v. Texas means the sale of sex toys um, has to be allowed. You cannot criminalize it. And the other court said, no, that's not true. Um, I actually find this one um, a little surprising there's a split on because it, it should have been easy for the lower courts to distinguish distinguish the sex toy criminalization from Lawrence v. Texas by the language Kitty uses was commercial versus non-commercial. The laws in question only criminalize the sale, not the possession of sex toys. And so it's not clear to me Lawrence v. Texas should have applied. So it's sort of a strange example in terms of its history. Gays in the military is sort of an odd argument because um, unlike O'Connor's uh, concurring opinion, which I've admitted, um, Kennedy's um, uh, opinion isn't specific or focused on the same sex aspect of Texas's law and instead says this is unconscionable across the board. Um, Scalia's argument seems to be here that if um, uh, people in the military of the same sex could engage in sex, that would run afoul of various parts of the UCMJ, and so therefore the, the don't ask, don't tell policy that was in place at this time would be in jeopardy. Public indecency, again, he seems to, um, Scalia seems to be either ignoring or just um, not addressing the fact that one of the limitations in Kennedy's opinion here is private, not public. And public indecency, the word public's right there. Um, bigamy, um, also a strange one. Again, I think it only works if Scalia has, has persuasively argued that Kennedy's opinion is a full embracement of the harm principle and arguably bigamy is not harmful to other people if you engage in multiple uh, marriages. Okay, uh, gay marriage. Well, again, I think this argument would fit better attack on uh, O'Connor's opinion, but uh, Scalia makes as well. And Lawrence was at least cited by uh, the later opinions dealing with domestic partner benefits and same-sex marriage. So there's something to it. It wasn't a essential to the holding, but it's there. Adult incest. Um, this is something we're going to talk about in one of our later cases. And um, at least this seems to be a sign that's closer to what Kennedy was talking about, right? Because it could be done in private, um, and it can involve... I, you say adult here instead of uh, uh, children. So it fits the, the, the criteria, the touchstones uh, that Kennedy sets forth. Masturbation. Well, this is one of the stranger examples uh, in this list, and a list that itself is kind of quite odd. Um, since this opinion's been written, many of us uh, have wondered what Scalia was talking about here. There was no citation offered, and in fact, there were no laws in the United States against masturbation. Um, so you're all safe. Don't worry. Uh, it is something that uh, has not historically been criminalized. Now, of course, if you do it in public, well, um, that would fit under public indecency. Um, so I'm not sure if Scalia is um, uh, confused about the scope of the law, or he's just advocating that this should be criminalized. Um, it's a little unclear. Adultery is something that uh, he also throws in there in the same way bigamy arguably uh, fits. Fornication. Fornication is just any sex outside of marriage, and there still are fornication laws in the books, just like there are adultery laws. Almost never applied. Um, when they are applied, fornication laws, it's often is a secondary charge as part of a plea bargain and say a rape case or something like that. Um, but they are uh, part of a history that was far more uh, socially controlling in the, the sexual arena from a criminal law perspective. Bestiality again, seems to fit poorly with the criteria that Kennedy sets out because it doesn't involve human beings, or at least not two human beings. Obscenity, 
Obscenity is one that you know is is a little tricky because uh, the underlying sexual conduct um, isn't what's uh, being criminalized; it's the filming and distribution of it. Um, and from that perspective, it does tend to cross into the commercial arena, but doesn't have to, right? Obscenity production does not have to be commercialized. And then we get the two you might be most confused with: um, heroin prohibition and labor laws. Well, heroin prohibition is again. Only uh, only makes sense if we're thinking in terms of the harm principle, um, and that if we think all drug laws are therefore in jeopardy afterwards. Um, labor laws, I think, is just it's what we call a judicial pot shot. Um, you will learn in constitutional law about Lochner. Lochner is considered uh, by most scholars, practitioners, and people to be a low point in Supreme Court history in terms of the Supreme Court adding rules and insights to the constitution that are that aren't there it has to do with economic freedom it has gotten you know a little more revival and popularity among libertarians but what scalia is doing here is he's saying you are writing a lochner opinion justice kennedy it's just a, a euphemism for a bad poorly thought out judicial activist opinion so um it's not that he's really thinking labor laws are in jeopardy i think i think it's a little hard and so going through this parade of horribles though does help us in terms of understanding two different views of what our governments could or should look like. And you might have different views on each of these, right? Some of you might just embrace the harm principle. And, and we'll talk in our, our class meeting, is that a workable rule? Is it something that uh, in a society you want to live in? Or some of you might uh, agree with Justice Scalia across the board and say, all these laws are good. We just we should have them, or at least the government should have the power to them. These notions of liberty and sexual liberty are, are nonsense, and this is a proper area for the government to exercise its role. And then a lot of you might have split views depending upon the particular crime here. And so this is why the Lawrence v. Texas provides a good framework for us to discuss the scope of criminal law, because these are a a set of crimes uh, uh, that sometimes fit under the label victimless, although that's not true of all of these, but a lot of them. And therefore, our rules about crimes against property and our insights about crimes against property and crimes against people, they don't apply. Instead, we're, we have to think through why is the government involved here? Why are we punishing people from a criminal law perspective in these cases? That's where I'll stop for today. Uh, next time, we'll pick up on applications of Lawrence in later cases.